Is it working fine now? Can you just confirm? Yes, it's okay. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so maybe yeah. I'll go back to this. Uh, so I was saying earlier that I'm a new informatician at the intersection between data science and brain imaging. And now I was getting into what we like, what do we mean by brain imaging in general? And um, there are a number of techniques uh, to image the brain. And I've put a, a few of them here, but there are many more. Um, so first on the left, uh, magnetic resonance imaging is the one I'm mainly using um, in, in my work. So it's a really big machines. Um, and uh, it provides image non-invasively. Um, and then there are other types of, so that's, that's one end of the spectrum. And then on the other hand, you have this um, approach that focus on that, that use um, smaller caps. So for instance, electron cephalography is used a lot um, and more recently near infrared spectroscope. So all of these techniques gives us different types of data that we can use and process to get information about the brain. And as I was saying initially, uh, in my work, I'm mainly working on with, with MRI, so magnetic resonance imaging. And before we get uh, a bit deeper into how we analyze MRI data, I just thought that I'll give a few first a few images of the type of information that we can get about the brain. So um, I'm uh, working with uh, human participants. So we are looking at the human brain here. And well, as you know, this is an organ in, in three dimensions. Um, and often when I look at brain images, I like to make a comparison with another 3D objects that we know quite well, um, the world. So, um, so here is our brain. And we'll see in the following that we can get many informations about it. So just like we can image deeper uh, into the earth, we can also look inside the brain and we have these two different types of tissues, white matter inside and gray matter that have different properties and that we're gonna image differently. So to give just a few examples, uh, some people are more looking into the anatomy of the brain. So. Uh, here we've seen the brain in 3D and you can see that on the top, there are a lot of what we call uh, gyrus and soul size, so basically heels uh, and, and the brain goes up and down and some people are really uh, focused on studying this, um, this particular, the, the, the anatomy of the brain because different, everyone has a, has a different brain. Um, Another type of information that we can look at is instead of looking at the anatomy on the outside and looking at like brain folding, uh, we can look at connections within the brain. So here I've put a, a map of, of uh, roads in your street. And similarly, we can look at uh, roads inside the brain and look like, for, for example, in this brain here, uh, you have two regions and you, you're looking at how basically they are connected. Um, and these pathways are in the white matter that we've seen earlier, which is inside the brain. So um, diffusion imaging is another type of uh, brain imaging that lets us get information about this structural connectivity. Another example of brain image that we will focus on mainly in this talk is um, functional MRI where we look at brain function. So here the idea is to look at one property that we are interested in. So maybe um, the participants are moving their hand while in the, in the scanner and we're gonna check which regions in the brain are used when doing that particular task. But we've talked about a motor task, moving your hand, but it could be any type of task. So listening to a movie, um, watching images and so on. And different type of tasks will activate different regions of the brain, sometimes with overlaps and, and so on. And so functional MRI is here to uh, give us information about brain activity. So just to give a summary of all the different types of brain, brain images we've been talking about. So we talked about like the human brain in general as this 3D object. We can study the anatomy. And then the example here was brain folding. We can also study connectivity between different regions. And we can uh, also study function in the brain, which regions of the brain are used to do which processing. Um, and this is only a small subset of the many different type of information we can get about the brain. 
And in this talk, um, I will mainly focus on functional MRI because that's the type of image I'm studying. But of course, all the other types of images and information about the brain also requires uh, processing, as we've seen, um, we'll, we'll see here in, in Python for, as an example. So just to give a little bit of context, I'll start by presenting a, a, an existing study, so a functional MRI study that was run in REN so some time ago in 2005. Um, and the goal of this study was to look at developmental language disorders. So basically 40 children participated in the study. Um, and the goal was to use functional MRI to better understand how their brain uh, works. And so here is an example of fMRI protocol that, that they went through, um, that they participated in. So when we do uh, functional MRI, and this is important because it helps us understanding the type of data that we're going to use uh, later to do the pro processings, basically we typically have uh, different phases. So phases where we have actions and phases where we ask the participant to stay still uh, in, in, the, in the machine. And so here in that particular study, the idea was to better understand how language is processed in the brain in these children because they have these um, disorders. And so during the action phase, um, they, they, they were asked to name images. And the image they had to name, and I'm going to say this in French because um, you'll see that um, the names are very close in French. So this is dans, bon, gant. So uh, a tooth, a bench, a glove, uh, but in French it's really close in terms of sounds and that means that even the meaning is really far away because the sounds are really close, this is something that can be difficult uh, for these children. And the idea was to study how which part of the brains are used to do that particular task. So that's, that's the kind of actions they had to do during the, um, the kind of task they had to do during the action phase and then during rest they had to just watch a rat cross and try and be as still as possible. And so the result of this study, the way we typically present fMRI results is as follows here. So basically what we have is as a background, we have um, an, an anatomical image, which is like a, a picture of the brain. And on top of it, we have regions in yellow to uh, red that corresponds to the regions that were used to do that particular task. So here at the top, we have a representation of the regions that were used um, for children who presented development language disorders. And at the bottom, we have um, a view of the difference uh, of activation between the children who presented uh, the LE and um, control children. And so that's, that's the type of results that we get out of fMRI. But now the question is basically how do we get from the data we have out of the scanner to that particular result? So here, before we get more uh, specifically into analyzing the data, I just wanted to do a little demo where we can explore functional MRI data. And for this, I'm going to use uh, mainly three tools. Um, so the first one is called Nightbevel. Uh, it's a Python library that lets us basically read uh, new imaging file formats because the way the image because the, the images are stored using specific formats. Um, then there is Nylearn, uh, which we'll use in that particular example uh, mainly for plotting these brains. And finally, uh, we also use uh, NeuroDocker. Uh, from the Reprenim team that lets us build the Docker container with the environment we need. So I'm going to just stop the presentation now and go to the code so that we can explore fMRI data together. Okay. So I think you should be able to see my screen properly. Please shout if not. Um, and so I'll get started. So the idea here is that we're going to look at fMRI data and we look at the results data as I've uh, shared earlier. So we're going to, so this was just the title. So this is a Jupyter notebook. We, we load the library 
the libraries, especially so the nylon library that lets us uh, plot the images. And then I have on my machines uh, three different images. So the first one is an anatomical image, so a picture of the brain. The second one is the activation image, so basically the areas in the brains that are activated. And the third, third one uh, is a functional image, so the one we had at the beginning. And now I'm just, I'll just shortly run this. Those are titles. And now we are going to look at the first one. Uh, so this line of code is basically showing, displaying the statistical map, um, the activation. So we are we are using the activation image, uh, the second files that we load, and we are displaying with axial slices. And as a background, we use the anatomical image of that particular subject. And then we have a number of coordinates that we want to display. So this is an axial view. So basically we're displaying slices this way, but uh, because it's 3D, basically we, we have many planes we could use. We also have a coronal view. Um, so this is going this way. And again, still the same image, the activation image, um, the anatomical image as background. And we could also, uh, third type of planes, we could also have a sagittal view. So this time we're going this way. Um, and then finally, what we often do is just have one of each uh, so that we can look more specifically at a location. So for instance, here um, in really bright yellow, this is the highest area of activation. Um, and so often what we do is we just go at this point and plot the three planes. Okay, so that's that's the final the final results we often display, uh, and these are made of two files. So first, the anatomical image that we're going to plot alone here with the three views, and so this is an, uh, an average anatomical image. Uh, and on the other hand, we have the activation. So those regions that were considered as active during the task that was produced. And combining them together, we get the final figures we, we had at the top. Um, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions as I go through those, of course. Um, and then finally, just to have a, a closer look at the data we had at the beginning, uh, here we're gonna display the functional MRI data. So we've, we've seen earlier that functional MRI, we're gonna have um, volumes that are acquired during the action and during rest and during action and during rest and so on. So basically we end up with a, a 4D file, many 3D files through time. So what I've um, displayed here is the average of all these files so that we get a single image. Um, so that's the type of image we have an, as an input. Um, and if we, so that's, that's how we can display it, but we can also look at this data as a matrix, basically. Um, and we see that this is a very, very, very big arrays where each uh, point represents a value. And in terms of size, we have here images that are 64 by 64 by 30. So that's our 3D image by 184 volumes. Um, so, so this was just to get you started with how, like, what how our fMRI data looks like, and and basically trying to better understand what we have at the beginning. So those really big 4D files, and what we have at the end, um, these activation maps are overlaid onto onto the anatomy. Uh, so there is a raised hand. Um, hello, hello. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good, thank you. How are you? I'm great. Um, so my name is Moa Lucy, and I have a question mainly on, on the programming part of everything, the Python aspect. How long do you think it takes to actually master the entire code of displaying the image? And then the second question is, is the software easily accessible? Like, can I download it from the internet or do I have to buy it? Um, 
So the question of, of mastering the tool is a difficult one because, well, as you're like probably aware, like when you work with a programming language, often you like you learn a few bits and then you master those and then you extend what your knowledge on the software and you can do more and more and more complex things. So I would say like displaying image as I've done here, if you have the images on your machine um, that's and, and you've already used Python code, that's, that's probably um, easy to do, I think as a, as a first step. But then later on we'll see end-to-end -end pipelines um, and this might take a, a bit more time, although like there are tons of examples on the web, so this can help get you started and hopefully the, the tutorial here will help as well. Um, about the tools themselves, they're all, all the tools I've mentioned, mentioned on the other slides, um, they are open source, they are free. Um, actually, I'll go back to my slides and I'll show you, I've put the link and you can go there and, and download them. Um, so let me go back here. Okay. Yeah. So does that answer your questions? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Okay, great. And and feel free to interrupt me at, at any time. I'm happy to work like that. Um, yeah. So, and, and also I should mention, so this is about the software, but there is also a lot of neuroimaging data available online that, that you can use to work with. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll get to that uh, later on. So, um, so this is, this was some code just to look at the fMRI data. Uh, but then I've, I've started to mention it a little bit. So um, the question now is we have some raw data, we, we get some data out of the imaging instrument, how can we convert those into information about the brain that, that we really care about? And, and to illustrate that a bit more, I'll get back to the examples I was presenting earlier, where you had this functional MRI study and basically we're alternating action with rest, with action with rest, with action with rest. Um, and in practice, what happens is that uh, brain volumes are being acquired. So during action, we have one brain and another one and another one and so on, um, up to the end of, of rest. And basically we, we end up, as I was saying earlier, with the 4D volume. So here 64, but earlier we, we had more. Um, and the idea is that we have to take these volumes and process them so that we can get these activation maps. And what the activation maps are like in principle, it's pretty simple. It's like um, a difference between what happens during the action and what happens during rest uh, with the statistical analysis so that we know whether the differences are, are significant or not. But there are a number of steps that we have to accomplish so that we can get from that row 4D data to those final results. And that's what we'll get into uh, now. Oh, sorry. So yeah, uh, I've put here an image processing pipeline, uh, but yeah, a set of steps that we have to accomplish. So question, so now just to uh, summarize a little bit, as an entry point, I have two different things. Uh, first, I have a functional MRI image, which is made of many uh, 3D images and an anatomical image. And the idea is that I want, I want to combine these two so that I can get my final image where I'm overlaying the activations on top of um, the anatomical image. Um, and so I've mentioned that we, we have to perform many steps in order to do that. And now I'll talk about one step in particular, uh, which is motion correction. So, to illustrate why we have to do motion correction, uh, we'll go back to our fMRI acquisition. So I have many volumes here, and we can imagine that the cat here at the bottom is our participant um, lying in the MRI. So here, basically, time point one, we are acquiring one brain, second time point, second brain, third, fourth, fifth, and we get a series of brains. But what really happens while people are in the MRI is more something like 
this. So, of course, people are not going to move their head that much, but MRI acquisition are typically long, at least in the order of a few minutes. And we're talking here about motion that can be under a millimeter. So that's that's very, very, very small. And basically, um, no one can lie perfectly still um, while in the, in the MRI. And so what happens is instead of having our brains well aligned, we basically have someone with their head moving, even though less than here, but that's that's a toy example. And so our brains actually are more like here. So the first one is straight, and then it's a bit on the left, a bit more on the left, and then on the right, and so on. And so our motion correction algorithm, the goal is to put all these brains uh, back Oh, sorry. back in place. So the images are tilted so that the brains themselves are actually aligned. And same with the heads at the bottom. And so that's one of the steps that we have to, uh, to do on the data. Um, and basically out of these steps, we get these type of graphs where uh, we, we've talked about motion. So here we were looking at the cat moving their head, but basically, uh, of course, we can move in three dimensions. So we have three rotations and three translations that are going to be estimated. Um, here on the left, you can see uh, an example where things went rather well. So here we had the millimeters, um, the, the motion in millimeters. So the first volume is at zero. It's our ref reference volume. And then each, uh, the next volume is, uh, is moved up to being aligned with the first one. And then we can estimate motion this way. So here we had motion that went from less than a millimeter in both uh, direction, so 1.5 in total, um, and less than one degree. So this, this usually works uh, pretty well. But the other example on the right here, you can see that you have this very big peak uh, with a three millimeter motion. So this sounds not very much, but at the scale of the brain um, and the images we are doing, this is a lot. So here we have motion that is both really big in terms of millimeters and uh, really sudden. And this is really hard to correct because you have little information, like you're losing information. Um, and, and now I'll just give an example of code where we've been, uh, where we can do motion correction. Uh, so here we're using another tool, which is called SPM for statistical parametric mapping. It's a tool that is widely used in the neuroimaging community. But and but it's a tool that is in MATLAB. And rather than using directly this tool, we're going to use a wrapper that is written in Python and that is uh, super useful here. Um, so the wrapper is called NyPipe. Um, so you can download SPM NyPipe. Everything is uh, open source and free to download. And so NyPipe will let you have a Python interface uh, to communicate with different new imaging software. So I've mentioned SPM, but FSL is another one, well, another widely used one, FreeSurfer and so on. So it's both an interface layer and a workflow engine that will let us uh, compose different steps. Uh, but this is enough. Oh, so that, that was the tool. And now I'm going to present a small uh, example with the Jupyter notebook again. Um, and I want to thank here uh, Elodie Germani, who is a student with me and has been working on the, on the code, has been providing a first version of the code that I uh, extended to, to have a, an example for motion correction. So let me go back to uh, the notebooks here. So here it is. Okay. And so I'll, I'll try and run the example, but at the end, I think we're going to have to uh, go back to the talk and maybe come back a bit later because it takes a little bit of time. So here in this example, uh, the initial version is reproducing an existing tutorial, which is available online. But for this first example, we're looking only at the motion correction step. So again, we're going to use uh, Nylon to display the images. So I'm loading the, the different libraries we need. And here, as I've mentioned, we're going to use that 
SPM tool, statistical parametric mapping, and that's exactly what those first lines are, are doing here. Um, and so now we want to uh, focus on motion correction. So we said we're using NiPipe. Uh, so we're going to load a number of modules in NiPipe. Uh, in particular, the modules realign and VARP, which is the modules that will let us do the motion correction. So I'm going to run this. And then I have a number of folders where I have stored the raw data and folders where we're going to store the output of our analysis. So if I look at the, the raw deer, I have two folders in there, one with raw API, this contains the functional, the raw functional MRI data, our 4D volumes, and another one that is called structural, in which we're going to have the anatomical image. Uh, okay, so our first node uh, will focus on selecting the right files. So here we have one anatomical file and a number of functional MRI files. So if I plot the anatomy, uh, you're going to see it here. Takes a bit of time because the file is a bit, a bit bigger than what we had earlier, but we find again our brain. Uh, we will recognize the nose here and the, and the three planes. And same as before, we can display one of the functional MRI volumes. I've chosen one here, but, but of course we could choose another one. It will look uh, very similar. So this first function is here to convert our 3D data into a 4D files. So that's not the most important part. The most important part is what we have here, which is really doing the motion correction. So we create a node, a step basically in our workflow uh, using the realign and VARP algorithm, which is the one we've selected in SPM. We give it a name, we give a name to the workflow, we say where the workflow is going to store its data, and then we can create our workflow. And here is the display of what we're doing. So we are selecting the files that are on the disk, the anatomy and the functional MRI. We are converting the functional MRI into a 4D file. So these are like format transformation. And finally, we are applying the realignment algorithm that we are interested in. And I'm going to run this, and as you can see, this is going to take a little bit of time. So we, okay. So I run. So you see the realignment is working now. And then once this is done, we'll do this. We'll look at what has been created in um, the output directory. So this is running the realignment. It will take some time. So I'll let it run in the background. Um, while this is working, we can just look at the outputs here that I had processed before. Um, so here we were looking at what was stored in the folder of our workflow. So I call the workflow MoCo for motion correction. And then in the realign folder, which is the folder corresponding to uh, the tool we are using here, we have a number of files. Um, and in particular, we have this one. Uh, mean 4D, which is the mean functional MRI of all the images that were realigned, and we can plot this one. So that's how we run basically a pipeline. And I think this, I, I really like these images that represent the pipeline. We run a pipeline with a single step. Oh, sorry, there is a message in the chat. Okay. Sorry, I don't know if I can do anything on my hand. Uh, I've stopped the video. Maybe this will help a little bit if the connection is not too stable. Okay. So I'll go ahead and continue unless there are more questions. And feel free to interrupt me at, at any time. Uh, so we've seen a pipeline with a, a single step, which was that motion correction algorithm. 
but in practice we might want to uh, add more oh i had this nice video so that's a video that i've borrowed from one of my colleague uh, quentin duché based in Rennes as well where you can see um, the output of the motion correction algorithm um, learning the parameters of, of motion at, and at the same time you, see, you will see at the top here the functional MRI images as a movie and you can see the motion happening so let's start so here we can see some motion over here we've seen the brain tilting a little bit and you can see the parameters getting higher you can see some motion here and we saw that peak here so we'll get to the end so i'll share my slide later on maybe you can have another look but basically when you see these peaks um the peaks in the graph that we can't see anymore at the same time the brains are typically moving either tilting like left right uh, up down and, and so on so that's what motion correction is is really doing here uh, okay so we've seen that already um so motion correction is one preparation step so we've seen that people can um, typically participants move while they are in the mri and so one step we have to do to prepare our data is to prep for that motion but there are a number of other steps that we have to perform uh, one example here is segmentations where we are going to um, separate the gray matter and the white matter and, in, and this can help later on um, putting all the data into a single reference space we also have to realign the functional and the anatomical image because just like participants can move during the fMRI acquisition they can also move in between the functional and the anatomical acquisition so um, and so instead of having a single step we typically have much larger pipelines where we uh, run one, one step after another and here i'm gonna um, show so we won't run it now but i'll show an example of pipelines that do uh, full pre-processing and again this is based on the production of a tutorial from spm using nipipe that was built by uh, elodie here so here again we're using spm and nipipe and so i'm switching back to uh, the other example so you can see that this has run now the motion correction but we've already looked at the results so here is a more a bit more advanced processing pipeline um, so we're going to import um, so i said i'm not going to run everything so we this time instead of importing just real line and unwrap we're going to import other uh, steps so core register for instance is the realignment between uh, anatomical and functional uh, segments is new segment is the segmentation and so on uh, we just as earlier we've defined our folders to store to get the data and to store the output data there are a number of parameters that we have to set and the beginning of the um, of the pipeline is is just identical to what we had earlier because we're working on the same data set so we're going to select the anatomical image select the functional image um, and define where the output is going to be stored and i want to get where we are defining so we're defining the different uh the different steps that we're going to combine and here we get to the workflow so we're going to do the realign with scenario then we do slice timing which is a realignment in time we do um, the co-registration so uh, we are realigning the anatomical and the functional we are going to uh, normalize these images uh, use a segmentation field bias correction and then in the end smoothing so we'll get to to that a bit later um, but but what's useful here is that we can watch we can watch the the pipeline uh, so we start from from what we had earlier we select the files we convert to a 4d file and then we do the realignment the cross modality realignment the segmentation and then the functional themselves are going into temporal realignment and then they are normalized into a common space so i haven't talked about normalization but those are basically more steps so that we can compensate for 
between subject differences. And here we get our full pipeline. Instead of having the single step, well, the three steps we had earlier, we have many more. Um, and as I said, I'm not going to run this, but basically it's going to run the data through the whole analysis. And we can look at what's available as an output. And then I'll get to, I'll get back to the design. So you. And so I've presented one other, so this was a pipeline with a few more steps, but basically working on how we are gonna process the data uh, is, is still an open problem. So I have colleagues, for instance, that uh, work on one particular algorithm. For instance, realignment uh, can be really difficult if you're looking at data from babies, for example, because their brain images look very different from ours and the tools from, from the one from adults um, and the tools we have for adults are sometimes not well suited to, to work with babies. So there are a number of uh, like research projects just focusing on each of these, uh, on each of these um, algorithm, but also um, there are a number of questions as to what is the best pipeline to analyze the data. And the picture I've uh, shown here is extracted from a research paper by Esteban and colleague um, describing a tool that is called fMRI prep. And the goal of these tools is to have an end-to-end -end pipeline um, that is again uh, continuized in Docker and is available online that lets you get the data as an input, give a big folder with all the data of interest, and then get the process data at the end. Um, so these were the preparation steps. But then after we've done that, we have uh, one more thing to do. Basically, we have to combine all those fMRI data so that we can, instead of having a pile of 3D images, get those activations uh, regions. And this is what is presented here. So this is typically a statistical analysis and we are going to represent, uh, to differentiate the phases of rest and the phases of action and to do basically a, a difference in the statistical test to check whether that difference is significant. And this leads us to areas of activation here in red. And we can also look at deactivation, the region in the brain that are more active during rest compared to, to action. Okay, so um, this is about it, about what we have about a demo. I can talk a little bit more about uh, my research if you'd like to, or we can just like chat if you have questions. I mean, I think the, the most important here is to like do what is more relevant for you. So please uh, do let me know what, what you prefer. All right. Thank you so much, Camille. Nice to meet you. I'm so sorry I was out of range, and but you're here now. Thank you so much. No, thanks for thanks for joining, and and sorry, yeah, like sorry that you had to miss the beginning. Yeah, no problem. And also, thank you so much for recording. Um, it was very interesting. The brain in neurology. So it's interesting to me. I find it so interesting. I started. I remember when I when I first did my first year, I did psychology and we learned about the neural networks. Do you have, do you use any machine learning for any brain imaging? Uh, so I do, I do some machine learning with some of my students, but not, um, not directly on the pipeline. So we do, here we do machine learning to try and understand, um, how the so basically just to to say a few words really quickly about my research so my research is focusing yeah. on those pipelines and understanding uh why different pipelines give us different results so we do some machine learning to try and understand how different results from different pipelines uh get together but yeah but that's that's like preliminary stuff and mm -hmm. so far all right do you have any data on Phineas gauge uh, no, I don't have Phineas <laughs> Gage, but that's that's a very good question. Um, yeah. a, new, a new group who had, I think, reproduced uh, his brain, but no, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have. Um, maybe I can say a few words about two upcoming events that could be of interest if, you, if that yes, works please. for you. Um, yeah, so I'll no, just please. I'll just keep all that because, oh, sorry, I need to get out of here. So, also, if you've the links you can put it on the chat 
Of course, yes. So I'll just, I have a few slides and then I'll put the links in the chat. Uh, okay. If that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there are two events coming I thought that I could cover with you because I think you have like an interest into data code processings and, and working together as a group. I think that's that's one one of the things the, the R ladies group are doing. Um, so there is a lot of like there is more and more collaborative research going on. And in particular in the brain community, we have what we call brain hacks, uh, which are hackathons dedicated for the brain community. So they've been going on since so this is a, a, a summary of like there there have been many brain hacks going on. Uh, for many years now. Um, the format uh, is a bit special in that there is a lot of time ded dedicating to doing projects together. So people come and then they group um, and they, they group depending on their interest and the work on projects. And there are also a number of educational sessions and then conferences. Um, so those brain hacks have been going on for, for a while in our community now, since 2012. Uh, but more recently, we started to have those as hybrid events. Um, and so in particular, the OHB and brain hack in 2020 was hybrid. And there is another one coming up pretty soon. So that's why I, I was thinking maybe that could be of interest. So the OHB and Brain Hack will be June 16, 18. Um, so in about a month. Um, and their registration is open right now. And I know, I do know they have fee waivers available if like if the the sorry, if the registration fees is an issue because they really want like people from diverse backgrounds to, to come and join. Um, and the idea is that people join, you can either uh, propose a project and then lead that project or join a project with someone who has um, proposed one. Um, and as I said earlier, there are also educational tutorials and so on. So that's one um, first event I thought I'll cover. And then there is another one coming uh, which is the General Assembly of the Neuroinformatics uh, Conference happening all virtually in September. Um, and they are all about like um, data sharing, data processing, and that's also something that uh, might be of interest. Um, and I'll share, so I'll just get out of this and share the link in the chat just now. Uh, okay, so, no, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Are this uh, hackathon some kind of uh, competition where some, um, I mean, those who are um, engaging can win something? So the so you you so you're right in that uh, a number of hackathons are, are competitive. Here it's not so the idea is really not to have a competition, but rather to have people collaborate on projects. So there is typically nothing to win um, except the like learning, meeting new people. Uh, maybe if there is a project of interest for you, you can just like send it and see if other people have interest. Um, I really find this useful to just like often like meet new people or hear about ideas or or learn new skills as well. Um, they often have tutorials about um, Git, but also MRI data and so on. Uh, so so no prize and no competition for this one, but but this, <laughs> this is our hackathon. Um, and I'll share the link to the INCF assembly as well. Mm -hmm. Good for my next. So the one. Guys, feel free to ask some questions. Hey Camille, I've also got another question about the, the hackathon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there any available data set online that um people can work on to practice? Like, and I've seen some neuroscience data sets are they the same as neuroinformatics i i'm sorry if you explained this but i missed it at the beginning but could they work on neuroscience to get ready for the hackathon data sets 
Yeah, so neuroscience, like what you said, neuroscience is just a broad field and like different people use different types of techniques. So myself, a lot of MRI, as I was saying earlier, but yeah, you like in brain hacks, you, you often have people with different type backgrounds looking at different types of data. Um, and, and the neuroscience, so I've seen on, on Twitter, like you tweeted the link with uh, resources uh, that were openly available for data. And in there you have a lot like open neuro, for example, is an example of, um, website where you can find MRI data doing the type of analysis to do the type of analysis I was presenting earlier. So um, there is there is plenty of data now available online that that can be processed during oh. these hackathons. Yeah, or, oh, okay. or at another time. I mean, oh, that's perfect. Oh, okay. So when we when you are doing the data analysis, do you have to understand how the brain works? Do you have to understand the dendrites, the neurons? And all the diseases. Do you also uh, do you also do any predictions on diseases like ALS? So I think I think like we we typically work in teams and we have people with different expertise. So as I was saying at the beginning, I come from a computer science background, so I'm really more into the analysis, how we can like my, my what I really what I'm really interesting interested in now is how can we make the best of the data that was acquired? If someone is sharing data, can I reuse it for my analysis? Are there specific issues and so on? So that's that's the kind of things I do. But we also work, for instance, with medical doctors who understand disease really well. We also work with neuroscientists who understand like the brain and which region work together. So it's, I think it's really teamwork and, and, and I don't know everything myself, but we work together to, to achieve this kind of things. Hope that makes sense. Okay. Oh, cool. oh, could you just, I, I know you explained your research briefly. I'm sorry, guys, if I'm taking over. I just find neuroscience so interesting. Could you, just, <laughs> could you just take us through your research, like from inception to where you are now? Oh, and, wow. Uh, <laughs> just <laughs> That's that's a big a big one. Um, so okay. I, as I said, I initially started as a computer scientist. So the first project I worked on was the clinical project I presented in the slide. So I was there mainly to do the analysis and do and and use the the more standard approaches. And then gradually I moved on into the the topic I was like describing, basically. There is more and more open research going on in neuroimaging, but beyond where people, instead of like working in a single lab and doing acquisition and then doing the analysis and then publishing, we might do, I don't know, many labs get together and, and agree on which type of data they want to acquire. Or even now, like some people are dedicated to building a really awesome data sets and many more are going to work on that data set. So my work has gone from like analyzing the data to trying to represent the data the best we can do so that others can reuse it and to um, and to how we can make the best of those data sets. So I, I hope that makes sense. Okay, no, it's understandable. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup once again. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> do we have any other questions from our members? Yeah, I was about to ask that. Bar, do you have any question? Oh, yeah. Oh, mm, uh, oh he doesn't have. Uh, yeah, Camille, may you also share your contacts, your Twitter and your email, if you can, your, like, your work email, so people can reach out to you okay. if people are shy to ask you. <laughs> so, um, Simone on Twitter. Mm -hmm. and, my, um, and if you're interested in the INCF uh, conference I mentioned earlier, um, the person over there said she's also very willing to connect with different communities, so I can give her email as well. Uh, um, oh Malin, I think is uh, Malin. Uh, let me check because I don't want to give the wrong email address. Um, okay, that's something definitely. Uh, I think I'm going to share this in the Twitter and the, in the Facebook as well. 
Okay. Yeah. So okay. please, please do not put the email directly on Twitter because that would. No, be no, 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 not the email. I mean the <laughs> the hackathon. Uh, yeah, that would be that would be fantastic. Yes, of course. Uh, sorry, I misunderstood. Yes, yes, if you can. Um, and I know like people, the 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 brain hack, they are very much into trying to like be as as welcoming as possible to new people in the community. So um, yeah, so that's on the INTF side. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. Does, does this presentation, like, does it have a course for it? Is there such a course like Python, applying Python in neuroimaging? Um, I, can, I can share a few resources, yes. So um, NiPipe has a nice set of tutorials where basically they guide you through running different pipelines and using open data. So I'll paste the link right now. I think these are really nice. Um, and we got very much inspired by this. Oh, and recently there was, let me see if I can retrieve it, uh, a neuroimaging data science. New, yeah. Um, what I have currently is I took up some online course and it was, or neuroimaging, so that's why I actually attended this this um, this meeting, and I have a background on Python, and this is a totally new type of Python, because I didn't even know you could apply that type of programming in medicine. Yeah, we do, we do a lot of Python in like in my field, at least in research. That's where I am, uh, and I've shared I've shared a link. So it's an I think it's an online book uh, with different like I think that well there is a brief introduction to Python and and different like getting started. So maybe that's a good that's a good resource to to look as well. Okay, well, it's uh, time for yeah, us maybe let's in. just call it uh, the end. Thank you so 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 much. Thank you to you both and, and let's keep connected. I'll stop the recording now and hope to see you around <laughs> on Twitter, maybe. <laughs> see you.